happy that I'm able to talk to you about my experiences of building an event processing pipeline at Sentry. Um, I think we have a very interesting one because of the type of data that we're dealing with. Um, and I want to give you like a rundown of some of the learnings here in the next 20 minutes. Um, in a prior life, I built a lot of open source software. You might be familiar with some of it. Um, I built the Flask framework for Python. Um, but the last seven years, I really spent a lot of time at Sentry building um, both the SDK infrastructure and the processing pipeline and all the things that sit in between. And when I'm not uh, busy working, then I'm spending a lot of time with my kids now. And this is also why there's less open source of me these days than there used to be. Um, I don't want to talk too much of the product, but I want to give you a very basic overview of uh, what it actually is that uh, we're doing. So you have an idea of what the context of this presentation is. Um, if you go into Sentry, which is a crash reporting application monitoring um, product, you will find this view. Um, this is basically a list of the uh, error events or, or also transaction events, depending, and that are coming in and they're grouped together by commonality. And so every single crash report that comes in uh, will end up in a group. And this means that we have to do a whole bunch of processing uh, as the events are coming in. And if you then click on an issue, this is what you might be seeing. Uh, this is one of, I think, from my perspective, one of the most interesting events we can process today. This is an IL to CPP crash report from a mobile Unity. Um, and what makes it interesting is that uh, it's a C-sharp application that's compiled to C++. Um, and we have to do multiple layers of um, processing on this event to get it back to so you can read the stack trace. In the first steps, we take um, and C++ memory, uh, like a memory address from a function call that um, is from generated C++ code. Then we go back via a dwarf debug information file to um, the transpiled C++. And from there, we use a portable PDB to go back to the original C sharp. And then we also send some source code along um, that we can then resolve on the server. And you can also see on this event, the list of tags on the top, which is data that we will aggregate in a column store. And we also have in this uh, event an example screenshot that can also be sent along as an attachment. So this is roughly what you can expect. Um, what the talk sort of covers is like, how does this kind of data go in and what are the challenges with it? Um, there are different types of events that make into the system. The smallest ones are session updates. This is basically um, something starts, something stops, something crashed, um, but without a detail on it. So it's just an, an abstract count of um, how many of my user sessions ended up in some sort of outcome that was not success. And this is a utility that we have largely to scale um, how critical something is. Transaction events is performance data. Um, so for instance, this can capture um, a distributed trace. And then we have the, um, the, the like on, on the bottom of it, we have basically the different types of reports that are coming in from basic uh, error messages to structured crash reports or even uh, mini dumps. This is uh, memory dumps of a crash where we have to do the most processing on the server. And then there's a whole bunch of other stuff, including attachments. So what are the challenges with this? So the biggest challenge is the user uh, really expects that the reports come in quickly with the lowest latency possible. But an individual crash report can actually have an incredible high variance of processing times. And this is multiple orders of magnitude. So an event can make it through the pipeline in let's say a millisecond, but an event can also be in a holding pattern for up to 30 minutes or more. Um, and how long this takes really depends on a lot of factors that we don't necessarily know at the beginning of it. Um, another part that's kind of interesting um, in, in how we built this is that when something makes it to the end of the pipeline, it might have an effect that will influence what happens in the future at the beginning of the pipeline. So in particular, for instance, the number of events that you will manage to get through in a certain period of time can affect your quota going forward. We have a spike protection system in place that will ensure that we uh, try to taper off um, very high spikes that are unexpected. And so we can reduce, for instance, the inflow of events. Um, another thing is that we built our pipeline so that it can be extended closer and closer to the customer. So um, we operate two layers of this pipeline to begin with, which is um, the innermost uh, ingestion system. And then we have points of presence around the world, but the customer can also run uh, a, a relay, which is a proxy um, in front on their own premise um, in order to, for instance, perform PI stripping before the data leaves their infrastructure. Um, in terms of how we function as a company, we're quite conservative to changes in the processing pipeline. And the big reason for this is that um, the type of data that we're getting is not just variant uh, in terms of like how long it takes to go through the system. It also comes from a lot of different sources. So we do control some of the SDKs. Um, so all of the SDKs that we write ourselves, we have quite a strong control over, 
But for instance, we also integrate into third-party crash reporting systems. So for instance, if you use the Unreal Engine, we are able to directly accept crash reports from Unreal. We also um, work with um, clients that customers themselves wrote. And so the because of the complexity of the event protocol, there's a lot of variance coming in that wasn't originally foreseen, but the, the, the protocol and the processing layer will sort of accept. And so we're, we're quite careful in, in more fundamental changes to this because every time we're touching it um, in a more fundamental way, uh, we will notice um, that something might have happened. So we are not opposed to changes to the pipeline, but we are relatively conservative. Um, so with that, let's go in a little bit and see what it consists of. Um, so the, the biggest part um, of source code that still exists is the monolith. It's uh, written in Python. It's the original sort of Django core century app. It's quite grown over the years and it established originally the pattern of using RabbitMQ um, via the salary abstraction layer. And this is in fact still how a lot of the processing pipeline works. Um, it still plays a significant part of how Sentry works. And when we were running into challenges in the past with it, we resorted quite a bit to invoking uh, Rust code, for instance, via CFFI. We have introduced a lot of Rust over the years. Um, and so we're using this both in independent services as well as we're using this to um, augment the Python libraries that we're using. Relay is our main ingestion system. It's written in Rust. Um, it is, as mentioned earlier, a little bit like an onion. So you can run more and more of these. It's quite stateful. It pulls in a lot of information from the system behind. Um, so um, unlike many of the systems that we have originally built where everything can talk to the database, Relay will uh, get some of its config updates and then keep them locally and then do some local processing relatively stateful. Um, it is also the first level quota enforcement system. So if a customer sends more data than it's allocated for, then we will reject it there. And it performs aggregation, normalization, PI stripping. So Molicator is an interesting internal service. Um, this is typically run uh, just on our infrastructure. Uh, it's written in Rust again, um, and it handles the symbolication for different data formats. Um, so if you have ever had a C++ crash, you're probably familiar with the different types of um, debug formats that exist. Um, on the Windows ecosystem, you have PDB. On, on Mac and Linux, you have typically Dwarf. But there are also the container formats that we need to deal with. So this is, for instance, portable executables or ELF. And we have support for all of these. And for that, we are also uh, very grateful to leverage a lot of the Rust, uh, Rust ecosystem for this. And what's interesting about Symbolicator is that in order to process this crash report, it can take a really long time. And so this system needs to talk to external services to fetch all this data. And this is what takes the time. And some of these external services can be really, really slow. The interest consumer, this is uh, one of the many consumers that we have where we shovel data from one part. We like a lot of Kafka. I'm going to talk about this in a little bit um, to some of the other part, which is uh, in our case, uh, RabbitMQ. And so this is one of the many consumers that we have that travels from one place to another place. All right, so what's the kind of data that's flowing um, and what does it look like? So we have basically two formats that are coming in or two classes of formats that are coming in from the SDKs. The preferred format is what we call an envelope. This is basically a, a format that we created which wraps different types of data. So you can have one HTTP request containing different types of uh, crash reports in one go. Uh, or it can be a crash report together with a memory dump, or it can just be a memory dump or a crash report with attachments or a session updates and so forth. Uh, or it can be a native uh, crash uh, format. So for instance, we can directly accept a mini dump to mini dump endpoint. Uh, we support an Unreal crash report directly to an Unreal crash report endpoint. But at any point, if it hits a relay, this relay will transform this into an envelope and send this onward. And these relays, as mentioned earlier, they can be stacked. Uh, we run two of them. Uh, in a series at the very least. So you will hit a point of presence and then you will hit the innermost one. Um, but the, the envelopes are interesting because they can also be uh, chained on sort of the client side. So for instance, we have a React Native SDK, which is written JavaScript, which can create an event, which then is put into an envelope, which is routed on the same device to an Android SDK lower underneath, which can augment this data and send it onwards. Um, and this entire system has a reverse path. So uh, Sentry will communicate the project configs to Relay so that Relay understands what type of processing to perform um, on the first layer where it is. So for instance, the PRI stripping, the rules which to apply, it will get directly from Sentry. Likewise, a Relay will communicate the rate limits upwards to the client SDK. So if a client SDK uh, should stop sending because for instance, the customer is heavily out of quota, we can sort of throttle this down uh, by the communication that the SDK will get from the Relay. Um, I will 
only very briefly talk about the kind of numbers, but just to get an understanding of how this looks like, the pop relays that we are operating for Sentry IO directly. So this is not the other installations that we are operating. Um, and it's also um, not counting all the traffic that's going in. This is really just what uh, what goes through the views layer is around 100,000, what I would call here events per second, but these are uh, actually uh, what we call like basic envelopes coming in. Um, and we're checked around 40,000 for different reasons, for instance, out of quota, uh, filtering, and so forth. The processing relays, which is the inner layer, actually get more events than the outer layers. And the reason for this is that the outer layer will throw away some of these events because it will, for instance, aggregate, but it will also then create new events that will send to the inner layer. And there's also some events which are bypassing the outer layer for some reasons, um, which are not that important for the talk. And then we have a global ingestion level load balance around this roughly 200,000 events a second that you will see. And all of these numbers are at what I call regular day peaks. So they can be much higher than that, but on a, on a regular day, the peak is, is, is around that. So that's kind of what we're looking into. The, uh, on, the, on the infrastructure side, the, everything from the innermost relay will directly write to Kafka, not to one Kafka topic, but different Kafka topics. And we're quite happy with that. Um, and for some of these events, like for instance sessions, uh, we don't have to talk to Rabbit at all. Like that will be bypassed. But for the error events, we will talk through, through Rabbit. The data, once it's done, it will go into big table uh, for just JSON dumps uh, and we aggregate the data into ClickHouse. And we also store some data that we want to be mutable in Postgres. This is sort of where the data goes at the end. So um, Kafka traffic, you can imagine it's pretty straightforward. We route based on what's, uh, what type of uh, event we have into different topics. The, the only really one that is a challenge is the error events. Uh, everything else is more or less straightforward. Attachments is, is a little bit of a wild card, uh, but I want to gl glimpse over this for this presentation. So the error event routing is really tricky. And the reason is that we don't have enough information in an error event to understand how long it's going to take. Um, so for instance, a Python event will make it through the pipeline very quickly because we do not need any processing. A JavaScript event can make it quickly through the pipeline because we do not need processing, but maybe we do need to resolve source maps and we don't have enough information ahead of time other than some heuristics if we need source maps or not. So we'll have to do some fetching. Um, and for native events, it's pretty obvious. Uh, a mini dump can be hundreds of megabytes. The debug information files can be gigabytes. So if we, if we don't hit the cache, uh, then it's going to take some time. And a lot of this processing that we're doing still happens in the legacy monolith. And this is relevant because this is written in Python. And so we have some constraints about the concurrency that we can do on an individual process. So what's the issue with event variance? Well, it all comes down to head of line blocking. If you are consuming data out of a Kafka event, if you would do it one by one, uh, the slow event in the beginning blocks every fast event afterwards. So if this one thing in the beginning takes 15 minutes, then everything behind it would wait. And that is obviously not acceptable because we don't want to have these partitions randomly pause. Um, so there are various different solutions for this. Um, but our solution just by how it grew organically over time is that we're basically um, consuming off a Kafka as topic very quickly and we writing the data that actually needs um, this kind of different variance processing into RabbitMQ instead. Um, there are alternatives to this, um, particularly you have a lot of concurrency. We can read a lot of events at once, but some fundamental issues remain, which is that the, even if you fetch, fetch a, a thousand of a Kafka topic in one go, uh, you still need to wait for all, at least the 1000 to be done. Um, to be able to commit the offset. So there is, there's some limitation to what you can do, but you can build some custom brokers on top of Kafka and people have successfully done this. But for us so far, um, the, the complexity of this didn't pay off. So we're actually using RabbitMQ despite maybe not being entirely happy with it. Um, but it's good enough for now. Um, and it, it avoids some complexities that I won't deal with. But we had to do some modifications to how we actually deal with this. So the first one is we let the tasks travel on RabbitMQ, but we don't put the payloads there. That's an optimization we already did many years ago. So the event payloads actually live in Redis. Part of the reason is that if one task invokes another task, and that might not actually need to do anything with the event payload because it's actually only operating on some metadata, for instance, it doesn't need to pull the entire payload out of Revit and then put it onto another task. So the, the payload effectively travels independently. It also means that the processing step that doesn't need to modify any of the data also doesn't have to do another write for the payload data. Um, the Python workers do pick up the task as they have capacity available. Um, there's one problem with this, which is we have some workers which we call polling workers. 
Um, so for instance, the symbolic header, this is an independent Rust service. It's not directly sitting on the queue. Instead, it's driven by a polling worker that's written in Python. Um, there's some historic reasons for that, but that's just how it works. So you have basically n polling workers and you have another scaling factor of n symbolic headers. And the polling worker will put a task to the symbolic header, will let it process and will pull for result. Um, this kind of works, but there are some limitations with this. Uh, in particular, it requires that the symbolic headers are somewhat evenly configured. And that wasn't always the case. So in particular, you can imagine an individual symbolic header has around one terabyte of disk attached. That's up to the brim filled with debug information file caches. And if a new symbolic header was, uh, was rotated in because we needed more traffic, that one would come up cold, which means it takes a lot longer for this to process any events. And so this meant that, for instance, a hot symbolic header, which was really well, um, well stacked with cache data, could do, for instance, the 10 tasks that we would give it per second, and it would spit out 10 results on average a second again. With the cold symbolic header, it might get 10 tasks in, but on average, it could only do two results a second. And because the load balancer outside of the symbolic headers doesn't really know the state in which the symbolic headers are, it would even distribute the request to all of them. And so this eventually meant that the cold symbolic header just came up as we're scaling up, um, would eventually fall over because there's too many requests pending on it. Um, and then it eventually it would just go in a downward spiral from there. Um, there are many good solutions to solving this. Uh, particularly, we would like to, to be directly involved in, 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 in the Rabbit and Q setup, um, but due to some uh, limitations, at least that's a bigger change. So what we did is we actually did some active cache sharing. So when a new symbolic data comes up, it gets the cache from other symbolic headers via a, a shared GCP, uh, GCP bucket. And so the cold symbolic header now warms up much, much quicker so that that scaling problem is no longer much of a problem. Um, but that leads us to some of the other challenges that we're having, which is a general limitation to the back pressure control. And we got it better over time, but I think this is an area where um, a lot of lessons were learned, which is that it's very easy for a pipeline to be built accidentally that one part of it can flush to the next one too quickly, which is not much of a problem if your stream of data is general most of the time the same, which is true for most systems. But every once in a while, you might have to hold something. And if you resume it, it might spill too fast to the next one. Um, and so this is why we now have a system which is a little bit called by me uh, deep load shedding, but it's basically a system to load kill switches into different parts of the pipeline. So if an event of a certain category, for instance, there might be a one consumer project, customer project, which just has malformed data in it for one reason or another, we can instruct the system by loading uh, a filter file, and then we can filter dynamically data as it goes into the system. And at any point in time in the pipeline where the filter would uh, trigger, it would discard this data. And this means that we can make some progress despite there being bad data in the system that we no longer want to accept. In that case, we can reach out to the customer and we can figure out what's going on. Lastly, I want to show a little bit of an interesting part about how we um, turned a small optimization to a fundamental part about how the architecture works. So Relay talks to Relay via HTTP. The innermost Relay obviously process, uh, sends data via Kafka to Sentry. It also then talks to Sentry via HTTP. Um, it will basically ask a config endpoint, hey, can I have the latest config update for this project? And eventually this config endpoint got really, really busy. And so we added some caches to it. And today we actually learned that we can directly make Relay read these caches. And on average, we are basically never ever fetching via HTTP anymore because Relay will directly read the same cache that the innermost century populates. And so our cache system actually has become an active communication channel. Um, you can kind of see how this changed at one point where on average, we still had around 10 to 20 projects that we would fetch on a single HTTP request from the innermost century to get the latest updates. Um, but now it's basically zero because we have more or less embraced the idea that we're using the cache for communication. And so now we proactively populate the cache. So you will very rarely see any misses anymore. Um, and so now we, it's a little bit of a, maybe not the most nice and clear looking solution, but it's a very pragmatic, very practical solution. Um, that has tremendously helped this kind of system to scale. Um, and now we no longer have to wait for data to come in um, via the HTTP request. And with that, uh, I'm happy to go and answer some questions that might arise. Thank you.